Because of the time of the year, I thought it would be appropriate to discuss Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. Some of the ways this day is observed or discussed are not always in line with the text, in my view, whether the source is from the traditions or the source is effectively a tradition which has been framed as if it's not a tradition. In this video, I wanted to address some of those points, but it's not my intention to try to solve everything or to state my conclusions as if they are the ultimate word of truth about Shavuot. There is still a question about observance now, which may not be entirely clarified by the text of the law, as I will elaborate. So what is Shavuot? It is one of the holy days or holy meetings or holy appointments described in the text of the Torah. It is one of the three celebrations, that is, the pilgrimage festivals, where all of the men are supposed to appear before Elohim every year, presumably at the Ten of Meeting. It is also one of the holy days which does not specify a date in the way that many of the others do, in that the command does not tell us to observe it on such and such day of such and such month. Those two elements in particular, the absence of the Ten of Meeting and the way the timing is described in the text, are the main sources of the complications with this command, in my view. The first thing I want to do is get into the text of the commands about this day. There's also a passage about another holy day in the law which relates to this, and I'll get into that. And I also want to talk about a verse in Joshua which is sometimes cited in order to explain the timing of this day. First, let's look at Exodus 23. In verse 14 it says, Three times you shall celebrate to me in the year. And then in verse 16, it refers to the festival of the reaping, first fruits of your deeds which you shall sow in the field. We will see that this is another term which is used for Shavuot whenever we look at the passage in Deuteronomy. This is the second of the three celebrations in Exodus, and Deuteronomy indicates that the second of the three is Shavuot. In this passage in Exodus, these three celebrations are all explicitly connected to the harvest of the land. The passage starts with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that is connected with the month of the Abib, or possibly the month of the Green Ears of Barley, as I would assume for the translation or the implication of it. There's a bit of debate around that specific word and the related issue of the start of the year. I don't intend to explain all of my opinions on the calendar in this video, but I go into that in some detail in my video about the new moon and the issues surrounding it, so feel free to check the description box for the link to that. For now, I'll just say two things about the beginning of the year and about the issue of the Aviv. Some have suggested that maybe Aviv was the name of a month that was observed already before the law was given. That may be possible, and there was a month in the land of Israel's initial captivity which has a similar name, but it's actually toward the middle of the summer rather than being in the spring, and that would create some problems in observance in my view. The similarity in name may actually be coincidental. Even though it somewhat resembles the Hebrew word, the origin of their month name may actually be associated with one of their Elohim rather than sharing any direct connection with the Hebrew. Also, if we look to Leviticus 2.14 and Exodus 9.31, it uses the word aviv just like it appears in reference to the month, and it appears to refer to a particular stage of growth of grain, probably specifically barley. Since aviv has a use outside of the name of the month, and since it is a clear technical term in Hebrew, and since the month is often referred to as the month of the aviv, my inclination is that the name is descriptive rather than just being an arbitrary, unrelated name. With many things in the law which could be considered as having names given to them, the pattern appears to be that the names are descriptive rather than being arbitrary. For example, with the Ten of Meeting, the text describes how that name is purposeful and it is about Elohim meeting with the sons of Israel at that facility. The Passover, there's the association with the passing over that occurred because of the offering. The Day of Covering or the Day of Atonement, the name describes what's going on with the festival. Shavuot or Weeks is the festival that occurs following the weeks. Sukkot or Shelters is when you dwell in shelters, etc. 
This is a clear pattern as far as I can tell. So my personal assumption is that the name for the month of the Aviv would probably have a purposeful and directly associated meaning behind it rather than just being an arbitrary name. All of that is to say, getting back to the passage about the three celebrations, it would make all of these celebrations connected with different harvests. So we presumably have the beginning of the barley harvest, which is connected with the Aviv. Then we have the harvest referred to in connection with the festival of the reaping or the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot. And that is recognized as referring to the wheat harvest, as we will see. And finally, we have the fruit harvest, which is connected with Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles, or in this case, the Festival of the Gathering. So, so there's a connection with the three different harvests and the three celebrations. If we look to Exodus 34 22, it affirms this connection with the wheat harvest. In the Festival of Weeks, you shall do for you first fruits of the reaping of wheat. Now we'll skip ahead to Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. Seven weeks you shall count for you. From beginning the sickle against the standing grain, you shall begin to count seven weeks. And you shall do the festival of weeks to Yahuwah, your Elohim, a corresponding voluntary offering of your hand, which you shall give according to which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is blessing you. And you shall rejoice before Yahuwah, your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter and your servant and your maidservant and the levy which is in your gates and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow which is in your midst, in the place which Yahuwah, your Elohim, shall choose or has chosen to make his name reside there. And you shall remember that you were a servant in Mitzrayim, and you shall guard and do these commands. We see the connection again with the pilgrimage and the voluntary offering. Also at the beginning of this, there is a connection with the timing of putting the sickle to the grain, presumably the barley. It says to count seven weeks, but it is more specific in the Leviticus passage we're about to look at. Well, we can clearly see there is supposed to be a seven-week gap between these two events. The timing of the first event is probably the key question for this issue, so that's what I think we need to look into next. In Leviticus 23, there is a description of Shavuot, but I'm going to start a bit earlier in the chapter so we can see the commands about that initial offering upon which the timing of Shavuot hinges. Leviticus 23, starting in verse 10, when you shall come to the land which I am giving to you, and you shall reap its harvest, and you shall bring a heap of the beginning of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the heap before Yahuwah for your acceptance. On the morning after the Shabbat, the priest shall wave it. And in the day you are waving the heap, you shall do a flawless young ram, son of its year, for an ascent offering to Yahuwah. And its tribute is two-tenths of flour being moistened in oil, a fire offering to Yahuwah, a soothing smell, and its libation of wine is a fourth of the heen. And bread and roasted grain and new grain you shall not eat until this very day, until you bring the offering of your Elohim, a long-enduring commandment for your generations in all of your dwellings. So it starts off by specifying that this is in the land. Then it refers to the offering being made from the beginning of the harvest. Presumably this is the beginning of the barley harvest. This part is particularly important when it comes to determining the timing of Shavuot. And the issue is that it doesn't say explicitly when it is done in terms of being on a certain number of day of a certain number of month. It apparently indicates what day of the week it is on. It says it is the morning after the Shabbat. But that is also debated, as we will get into later. Just based upon how it falls in the list of the different holy appointments or holy meetings in this passage, one might assume that it is either going to come after the Feast of Unleavened, or it is going to at least come after the first day of the feast. As far as the annual observances are concerned, this chapter appears to list them in chronological order, and this one comes after the description of the Feast of Unleavened. 
practically speaking, since it has an offering associated with the first fruits of the harvest, and since there's supposed to be a voluntary offering associated with the three pilgrimages, it would make sense to me for the timing of this offering to coincide with the first pilgrimage of the year. There doesn't say there are four pilgrimages, and from a logical perspective, since the timing of the Feast of Unleavened has this association with the barley, specifically the stage of the barley that's expected to be offered as described in Leviticus 2.14, I wouldn't see any reason for this to not coincide. Because of those details, it seems reasonable that the offering would take place either within the Feast of Unleavened or immediately after it. Even though that may make sense, it's not explicit. The text doesn't actually say that directly, so I think we want to recognize the nature of that assessment. Another aspect of this is the use of the word Shabbat in this command, or more specifically, the Shabbat. Some say that maybe this could refer to the first or seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but the text never does that. Nowhere in the Torah does it use this word for those specific holy days. The only day it refers to with this word, other than the seventh day of the week, is the Day of Covering or the Day of Atonement. And the only day that it refers to as the Shabbat is the seventh day of the week. So to me, it's pretty obvious that it is talking about the Shabbat as in the seventh day of the week in this passage, though I will admit that it is conspicuous that it refers to the morning after the Shabbat, and it doesn't explicitly say the first day of the week. Some also refer to a passage in Joshua which we may want to look at. As a disclaimer, my view on Joshua and other books which come after the Torah is that they can be useful to understand what the people thought or did, but I do not hold it as law. It's the, not the same thing as the Torah, so anything it commands or anything it says about the commands still needs to be approved of by the Torah. Considering there is a command that says to not add to or take away from the commands, they're not going to be adding to or taking away from the commands, at least legitimately. So the reason I'm referencing this is, number one, other people use it as a source on this topic, and number two, as information about what they did. Joshua 5, 10 through 12. And they did the Passover in the 14th day of the month at evening. And they ate from the yield of the land from the morning after the Passover unleavened bread and roasted grain in this very day, and the mon ceased. Some use this passage to clarify when the timing of that offering should be because they were eating from the yield of the land, which in the law they were required to do the offering before they did that. You might notice that there is some similarity in some of the wording here. To me, it seems kind of strange to suggest that this proves that the first day of unleavened bread supposedly counts as Shabbat for the purpose of the timing of the offering. And on the other hand, I also think it's odd to suggest that this proves that the first Shabbat of the feast is supposedly the day preceding the offering. In reality, in terms of what is explicitly said here, we don't even know that they actually did the offering. One might point to the miracle of the manna or the mon as being evidence that this was recognized by Elohim, but looking at it another way, it's actually describing the ending of that miracle. There could be more than one explanation as to why Elohim would stop providing that. If a person just assumes that the people were necessarily following the law in Joshua, despite the fact that we know they did not always follow the law, and despite the fact that Deuteronomy says the people will very quickly turn away, after Moses dies, if despite that a person assumes that the people follow the law perfectly, then they might assume that the offering was done at some particular timing, even though the text doesn't say it, and then use that assumption as if it informs them about some general rule as to what the law tells us to do. At that point, I think we're at such a level of abstraction that it's not really legitimate information. It's multiple levels of detachment from the text. I don't see how this verse can be used as legitimate proof of anything in particular without adding in a number of assumptions on top of that. And even that assumes that one believes that Joshua has the ability to inform us about the law in a way the law doesn't actually describe. It goes beyond just informing us about the meaning of a word used in the law or something like that. I don't think this passage is particularly useful to us 
but I felt the need to address it regardless. Now I want to return to the law and what it says about Shavuot. Getting back to where we left off in Leviticus 23, starting in verse 15. And he shall count for you on the day after the Shabbat, from the day you bring the heap of the wave offering, seven Shabbats shall be complete. Until on the day after the seventh Shabbat, you shall count fifty days, and you shall bring near a new tribute to Yahuwah. From your dwellings you shall bring the bread of a wave offering. Two of two tenths of flour they shall be. They shall be baked leavened, first fruits to Yahuwah. And you shall bring near with the bread seven flawless young rams, sons of the year, and one young bull, son of the herd and two rams. They shall be an ascent offering to Yahuwah, and their tribute and their libations, a fire offering, a soothing smell to Yahuwah. And you shall do one haired goat from the goats for sin, and two young rams, sons of the year, for a slaughter of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahuwah with two young rams. They shall be holy to Yahuwah for the priest. And you shall call in this very day a holy convocation it shall be to you. You shall not do any work of service, a long enduring commandment in all of your dwellings for your generations. And in your reaping of the harvest of your land you shall not completely reap the edge of your field in your reaping, and the leftover grain of your harvest you shall not pick up. You shall leave them for the humble and for the sojourner. At the beginning of this passage, we have the discussion of the timing of this event. The people are supposed to count from the day after the Shabbat. It refers to that as the timing of the wave offering as we discussed. Then the next verse describes this as counting 50 days. This is the timing which we are concerned with. We have the timing of the weeks, that is the weeks of the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, being tied to that offering as we looked at. So if we know the timing of this wave offering, and if we don't add anything in like the concept of incomplete or partial weeks, which is not described in the Torah, then we should know the timing of the Shavuot. So it comes back to the timing of this offering, which in my view is not entirely explicit. As a skin in the game disclosure, while acknowledging that this is not as explicit as I would prefer, I personally recognize the Shabbat which falls within the Feast of Unleavened as the Shabbat referred to in these passages. The reasons for that include the things I discussed, like the logistical aspect of presenting the offering within the first pilgrimage. I count the 50 days from the day after it, so I recognize it as being on the first day of the week. The way I observe Shavuot, since there is the absence of the tent of meeting, is by not doing work of service, so I don't do agricultural work, I don't do work on other people's behalf, etc. My hope is that this discussion redirects our thinking more toward the Torah and the text of the law, and hopefully we continue to make distinctions between what is the law and what is not, what is explicit in the text, and what is not.